Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and my co-host is Katie McFound, her voice. Sorry, guys, you don't get to laugh at my squeaks this week. Hopefully we say and do other things to make you laugh, though. Yep, that's my goal. (laughs) So let's just keep rolling right into our rolling rehash. Last week, we discussed Chapter 18, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, and its corresponding film scenes, or lack thereof. Crazy Gary Oldman turned into impatient Gary Oldman. Usually quiet and reserved Remus Lupin turned into quite a long-winded storyteller. Harry, Hermione, and Ron turned about 17 different shades of confused as new info came to light. Snape turned into the world's most unwelcome house guest. And just wait until you see what Scabbers turns into. During episode 57, bringing sexy voice back, Our Potter pondering was, what do you think you would become if you were an Animagus? Would it be the same animal as your Patronus, or do you think it would be a different animal? Diana said that as much as she would like to think she would be a cat in her Animagus form, she would probably mirror her white mare Patronus. Intelligent, courageous, and sometimes strong-headed. Sometimes. Ha! (laughs) Her words, not mine. (laughs) She also adds that she does love a good frolic in a field, so it seems reasonable. Max said he desperately wants to be a hare because they're the cutest of the long-eared animals and it would be very useful. Carly said that she would be a dancing kitty cat. Like a gif? It said, I'm a kitty cat and I dance, 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 dance. So. <laughs> That's very on trend for Carly. Dave said, golly, so many choices. He thinks an octopus would be cool. And a T-Rex, but he's too lazy to hunt all the time, so he'd probably be a Stegosaurus and just amble around munching on plants being awesome. He also thinks a hedgehog would be sweet, but figures he'd probably have the skills of Longbottom and end up a kumquat with his luck. So I love the fact that the first thing he said was octopus because it makes me think of penguins of Madagascar and he's Dave! If you haven't seen Penguins of Madagascar, you need to. It's so fucking funny. I always think of the octopus from Finding Dory, how he wants to get back to Cleveland. It's a good place. Hmm. Juliana said that her Patronus is is a husky, and she'd be fine with turning into one as an animagus. Quincy said he would like to think he could become a horse of some type, or maybe even like a bird of prey. That'd be really cool. Along those lines, Jackson said that he'd be a wedge-tailed eagle, And to look them up, they're amazing birds. So I did, and they really are. They've got some legs. Yeah? They're they're so cool looking. Legs for days. Legs for days. Look at the gams on that (laughs) wedge-tailed eagle. (laughs) Oh, I've got to have respect for anyone who uses the word gams. So well done. Thank you. (laughs) Eric said that his Patronus is a mastiff but he'd like to think his animagus would be something with wings, like an eagle or a raven. Are you a Ravenclaw, Eric? Sounds like it. Yeah. Brittany said her Patronus is a deer hound, and she thinks she'd become a dog, but probably like a lazy dog, like a bulldog or something. I feel that. Alice shared a gif of a golden retriever. And boy, was it adorable. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you all so much for your responses. We had quite a few people participate this time, and I love it. Right? It's so fun. Our trivia question last week was, how did Black find out where Scabbers was? Fudge was carrying the Daily Prophet with the picture of the Weasley family on the cover when he went on an inspection of Azkaban. Sirius saw the picture and recognized Scabbers, who was chilling on Ron's shoulder, as Peter Pettigrew, partially due to his missing toe. Congratulations goes to Mike Riley. He won two weeks ago, so this isn't a streak yet, but maybe it's the start of one. Mm -hmm. He again posted on the episode post rather than the trivia post, but this time it was totally my fault. Since I switched the episode release to Friday due to Thanksgiving, I messed up my system and forgot to schedule the post to publish the same time as the episode. (laughs) Quincy did try to sneak in and steal it from him, claiming that he was the first to post in the correct location. 
But since it was Ellen's fault and Mike had the right answer first, that didn't stick. But Quincy can always take comfort in the fact that he was the first to get the eight-week streak record that he and Max now hold together. But Mike's quick. Is he going to start his own streak? We shall see. For now, let's just keep rolling into Chapter 19, The Servant of Lord Voldemort, and the sort of, but not really, corresponding film scenes. Chapter 19 The Servant of Lord Voldemort Hermione screams at Snape's reveal, and Black jumps to his feet as Snape tosses the invisibility cloak aside and says that he found it at the base of the Whomping Willow, thanking Potter for its usefulness. He tells them that he knew they were there because Lupin forgot his potion that night, and he took some to his office, getting there and seeing a certain map lying on the desk that showed him running along the passage under the Whomping Willow and out of sight. Lupin tries to tell Snape that he's making a mistake, but Snape is too caught up in his own version of events, saying there will be two more for Azkaban tonight and wondering how Dumbledore will take it. Lupin calls him a fool and asks if a schoolboy grudge is worth putting an innocent man back in Azkaban, and Snape responds by magically tying him up. Black starts towards him, but Snape threatens him with his wand, and Sirius backs off. Harry isn't quite sure what to do, but Hermione steps forward and tries to tell Snape that it wouldn't hurt to hear what they've got to say. Snape tells her that they're out of bounds and to hold her tongue. She tries to argue and he yells at her to keep quiet and calls her a stupid girl. As Hermione falls silent, Snape turns his attention back to Sirius and says that vengeance is very sweet. Black tells him that the joke's on him again because as long as Ron takes his rat up to the castle, he'll come quietly. Snape says that there's no need to go up to the castle. He will just call for the Dementors as soon as they're out of the willow. Black turns pale and pleads for him to hear him out, but Snape is beyond all reason. He tries to get them all to leave, saying he will drag the werewolf, but Harry crosses the room and blocks the door. He tries to point out that Lupin could have killed him about a hundred times this year, so if he was helping Black, why didn't he? Snape tells him not to ask him to fathom the way a werewolf's mind works, and Harry begins yelling at him, calling him pathetic. This sets Snape off, who yells at Harry also, and says that he's just like his father, and telling him to get out of the way. At the exact same time, Harry, Ron, and Hermione all cast Expelliarmus at Snape, who was thrown back into the wall and knocked out. Black tells them that they shouldn't have done that, as Hermione freaks out and Harry unties Lupin. He tells them that he's not saying he believes him, and Black says that it's time they offered him some proof. He asks Ron for his rat, and Ron wants to know if he really expects them to believe he broke out of Azkaban just to get his hands on Scabbers. Even if Pettigrew can turn into a rat, how would Black know which rat he is? Lupin says this is a fair question, and Black explains that he saw him on Ron's shoulder in the picture of the Weasley family that was in the Daily Prophet. He got it from the minister when he went to Azkaban for an inspection last year. Lupin looks closely at the picture and sees that Scabbers is missing a toe, and confirms with Black that he cut it off himself before transforming. He then tells Ron that the biggest bit of Peter they ever found was his finger. Ron thinks that Scabbers probably had a fight with another rat, and says that he's been in his family for ages. Black points out that it's been 12 years and asks if he ever wondered why he was living so long. Ron thinks they had been taking good care of him, and Lupin says that he isn't looking so great now. Ron tries to say that it's because he's scared of that mad cat, and Harry remembers that Scabbers started looking ill before they met Crookshanks. Black tells them that the cat isn't mad, he's extremely intelligent, and knew immediately that he and Peter weren't what they appeared to be. It took a while, but he gained his trust, and Crookshanks had been helping him try to get to Peter. He figures he must have realized what was going on and ran for it, faking his death again. Harry wonders why Pettigrew faked his death, and says that he thinks it's because he knew Black was about to kill him like he killed Harry's parents. Lupin interrupts to explain to Harry that all this time they had it backwards. They thought Sirius betrayed his parents and Peter tracked him down, but it was the other way around. Harry begins yelling that that isn't true. Black was their secret keeper and said that he killed them. Black says that he as good as killed them because he was the one who persuaded them to switch to Peter as their secret keeper. Black says that he as good as killed them because he's the one who persuaded them to switch secret keepers. 
The night they died, he went to check on Peter and found him gone with no struggle. He set out for their house, found them dead, and realized what Peter did, what he'd done. Lupin is done arguing about it and demands Ron give him the rat. He assures him that they're just going to force him to show himself and it won't hurt him if he really is just a rat. Together, Black and Lupin point their wands at the rat and with a flash of blue-white light, he transforms into a shrunken, balding man with rat-like features. Lupin greets him pleasantly and Pettigrew nervously looks around the room and addresses his old friends before he begins insisting that Black is there to kill him like he killed Lily and James. Lupin insists that no one is going to kill him until they've sorted a few things out, and Pettigrew says that he knew Black would come for him. Lupin wonders how Pettigrew knew Sirius was going to break out of Azkaban when no one else has ever done so before, and Pettigrew says it's because he has dark powers the rest of them can only dream of. This causes Sirius to laugh and taunt Pettigrew, telling him that he hasn't been hiding from him, he's been hiding from Voldemort's old supporters, because they think the double-crosser double-crossed them. This makes Pettigrew look even more nervous, though he still pretends he doesn't know what Sirius is talking about. Lupin tells him that he has difficulty understanding why an innocent person would spend 12 years as a rat, and Pettigrew says that he was innocent but scared. If Voldemort's supporters were after him, it's because he put their best man in Azkaban, the spy Sirius Black. Sirius challenges this accusation, asking when did he ever sneak around people stronger and more powerful than him. He tells Peter that he doesn't understand how he didn't see it before, because he always liked big friends to look after him. It used to be him, Remus, and James. While they continue to argue about it, Hermione speaks up pointing out that Scabbers had been sleeping in Harry's dormitory for three years, and wonders why he never tried to hurt Harry before now. Black answers her question, explaining that Peter never did anything for anyone unless he could see what was in it for him. He wasn't going to commit murder right under Albus Dumbledore's nose. So he found himself a wizard family to take him in so he could keep an ear out for news. Hermione asks another question, this time addressing Black, wanting to know how he escaped from Azkaban if he didn't use dark magic. Sirius explains that he thinks it's because he knew he was innocent. Since that wasn't a happy thought, the Dementors couldn't steal it and he was able to keep his mind. When he saw Peter in the picture and realized he was at Hogwarts with Harry, it became an obsession that helped him grow stronger. One night he snuck past the Dementors as they brought him food and as a dog swam back to the mainland. He traveled north to Hogwarts and has been staying in the forest ever since, except when he went to watch Harry play Quidditch. He tells him that he flies as well as his father did, and his voice croaks as he says he would have died before betraying James and Lily. Harry finally believes him, and as he nods, Pettigrew falls to his knees and begins begging for his life. After pleading with Sirius, Remus, Ron, and Hermione, he turns to Harry and tells him that he looks just like his father. Sirius yells at Pettigrew for speaking to Harry about James. Pettigrew says that James would have shown him mercy, and both Black and Lupin seize him by the shoulders to confront him about betraying the Potters. Peter claims that he didn't have any other choice. He was scared and didn't mean for it to happen. Black yells again, telling him not to lie. He had been passing information to him for a year before Lily and James died. After saying that he was taking over everywhere, Peter asks what there was to be gained by refusing him, and Black responds, only innocent lives. In a final attempt at an excuse, Peter whines that he would have killed him. Black yells that he should have died rather than betray his friends, and Lupin tells him that he should have realized that if Voldemort didn't kill him, they would. Before they can, though, Harry stops them, saying that he doesn't reckon his dad would want his best friends to become killers just for Pettigrew. He says he can go to Azkaban instead if anyone deserves that he does. Lupin agrees and asks Harry to stand aside so he can tie Peter up telling him that if he transforms, he will kill him. Then he uses magic to strap up Ron's leg and mobilize the unconscious Snape. Black says two of them should be chained to Pettigrew and Lupin and Ron volunteer. He conjures manacles and chains each of Peter's arms to one of Ron's and Lupin's. Crookshanks leaps off the bed and leads the way out of the room. The movie section picks up with Snape holding Sirius Black at wand point. Lupin tries to step in to explain, but Snape just points the wand at him as well, saying that he told Dumbledore that he had been helping his old friend get into the castle, and now he has proof. Black mocks him, telling him that once again he puts his keen and penetrating mind to the task and as usual comes to the wrong conclusion. 
He tells Snape that he and Remus have some unfinished business to attend to, but Snape just points his wand right at Black's throat and tells him to give him a reason. Remus tries to tell Severus not to be a fool, but Black continues his mocking, saying he can't help it, it's habit by now. Lupin tells him to be quiet, and Black yells back for him to be quiet. Snape comments that they are arguing like an old married couple, and Black tells him to go play with his chemistry set. Snape tightens his grip on his wand and jabs it harder into Black's neck, saying he could do it, but why deny the Dementors when they have been so longing to see him? Sirius starts to back away a little, and Snape walks forward with his wand still at his neck, asking if he detects a flicker of fear. He begins talking about the Dementor's kiss, wondering what it must be like to endure. It's supposed to be nearly unbearable to watch, but he'll do his best. As Lupin again tries to plead with Snape, Harry reaches behind Hermione's back and draws her wand out of her pocket. Snape gestures Lupin and Black out the door, and Harry steps forward, raising the wand. He calls Expelliarmus and sends Snape flying backwards into the four-poster, which collapses on him in a cloud of dust. Ron and Hermione are shocked that Harry just attacked a teacher, but Harry just points the wand at Lupin and Black and demands they tell him about Peter Pettigrew. Lupin tells him that he was at school with them, and they thought he was their friend. Harry insists that Pettigrew is dead and points the wand at Black again, saying that he killed him. Lupin moves in front of Sirius again and continues to explain that he didn't, that he thought so too, until Harry mentioned seeing him on the map. Harry says that the map was lying and Sirius interjects, saying that the map never lies. He reiterates that Pettigrew is alive and points towards Ron, saying that he's right there. Ron wonders why he's pointing at him and calls Black mental. Black rolls his eyes and tells him that he doesn't mean him, he means his rat. Ron clutches at Scabbers and begins to talk about how long he's been in his family, but Black cuts him off to say that it's been 12 years, which is a curiously long time for a common garden rat. He also points out that he's missing a toe, and Harry remembers that all they could find of Pettigrew was his finger. Black explains that he cut it off so everyone would think he was dead, and then he transformed into a rat. Harry asks him to show him, and Black yanks the rat from a protesting Ron's hands. Scabbers frantically begins squeaking as Black and Lupin both point wands at him. He sets him down on an old dusty piano, and before he can cast a spell on him, the rat runs off. They chase after him as he runs down the piano, off a couple of keys, and on the floor. He heads towards a hole in the door, and Black manages to hit him with the spell right as he tries to go through it. Transforming from a rat into a middle-aged rat-like man with balding, stringy hair and buck teeth, he gets stuck in the door. Lupin and Black pull him out and shove him back into the room. He continues to act very rat-like before looking up at them and recognizing his old friends and making another run towards the door. They catch him and shove him back again. He looks around the room, sees Harry, and approaches him, telling him he looks so much like James. Sirius lunges forward, snarling at him for speaking to Harry and talking about James. Peter runs for cover behind the piano and Remus and Sirius corner him, Remus confronting him about selling James and Lily out to Voldemort. Pettigrew tries to insist that he didn't mean to, saying that they had no idea of the weapons the Dark Lord possesses. He asks Sirius what he would have done, and Sirius screams that he would have died rather than betray his friends. Pettigrew drops to the ground and crawls under the piano to try and escape again. Harry steps in front of the door to block his path, and he grabs him by the shoulders and whispers that his dad would have spared him and showed him mercy. Remus and Sirius pull Peter off of Harry and point their wands at him. Sirius tells him that he should have realized that if Voldemort didn't kill him, they would. Before they can kill him, though, Harry yells no. Remus reminds him that Pettigrew is the reason his parents are dead, and Harry says that he knows what he is, but he thinks they should take him to the castle. Pettigrew starts groveling at his feet, but Harry tells him to get off of him, saying they'd take him to the castle, and after that, the Dementors can have him. Pettigrew snivels and brings his dirty, claw-like fingernails to his face. So this week, we have a lot more that corresponds between the book and the movie, but once again... We're running into the fact that it runs parallel, but the movie still has quite a few differences and a lot of information left out. Yeah, they both start out right with Snape's grand entrance, but as we mentioned last week, even that was done differently from the book to the movie. Yeah, in the book, he had used the invisibility cloak that Harry and Hermione accidentally left at the base of the Whomping Willow Tree. 
he snuck into the room and waited to reveal his presence until he heard his cue. In the movie, he just flounced up the stairs and billowed into the room immediately disarming Black and holding him at one point. The direct approach. Right. (laughs) In the book, it's actually Lupin that he's holding at one point, and he thanks Potter for usefully leaving the invisibility cloak at the base of the tree. He's also barely suppressing his triumph as he feels the need to explain how clever he was in figuring out where they were. Ten points to Snape. I'm so clever. (laughs) In the movie, he does gloat a little, saying that he told Dumbledore that he had been helping his old friend get into the castle, and now he had proof. He says something similar in the book as well, but it's after he explains that he was just in Lupin's office to bring him his potion. Instead of finding Lupin there, he found a certain map, and with one glance at it, he knew all he needed to know, seeing Lupin running along this passage and out of sight. Lupin tries to explain that he's making a mistake, but Snape basically doesn't even hear him. He's so caught up in his own triumph. In the movie, it's Black who tells Snape that he's wrong, and sassy Gary Oldman is even better than crazy Gary Oldman, because he says, once again, you've put your keen and penetrating mind to the task, and as usual, come to the wrong conclusion. In the book, Lupin gives him a little bit of sass, but not really. (laughs) He just calls him a fool and asks if a schoolboy grudge is worth putting an innocent man back inside Azkaban. And Snape responds by magically making cords appear and tying Lupin up. This does not quite happen in the movie. Lupin does tell Snape not to be a fool, but sassy Gary Oldman interjects to say that he can't help it, it's habit by now. And I feel like if this exchange was said by younger actors, I could totally see this scene being in a movie about Hogwarts in the 70s. I do love the dynamic they brought to life for these characters. Mm -hmm. It was there in the book, but Alan Rickman, Gary Oldman, and David Lewis brought this to life brilliantly, even if it was different from the book. Yeah, in the movie, Remus and Sirius end up arguing. And for real, though, I always thought that crazy Gary Oldman told Lupin to go bite himself instead of be quiet yourself. And that's how the line should have been. That's just a beautiful line. Come on, it's hilarious. Go bite yourself, Remus. Come on. He's a werewolf. (laughs) That's why it's funny. Yeah, it's like a whole thing. It's funny because it could be true. Right? (laughs) It's funny because that's totally something that serious would throw in Remus's face when he's pissed off. You know? Like, that's just, that's something you say to a werewolf, I feel like. Anyway. Then Snape tells him that they're arguing like an old married couple, which just goes to show that he was a secret Remus serious shipper himself. He probably started it. <laughs> in the book, the two friends never argue with one another. Partially because Snape has Lupin gagged, but also because that's not how it happened in the book. Well, it's partially because he's gagged. <laughs> Once Snape ties Lupin up, Sirius angrily charges towards him, and Snape tells him to give him a reason to do it, and he swears he will. That last part does kind of happen in the movie, when Sirius tells Snape he and Lupin have some unfinished business to attend to. In response, Snape presses his wand to his throat and tells him to give him a reason. But he also goes on to say that he could do it, but he doesn't want to deny the Dementors. Then he talks about the Dementor's kiss being unbearable to watch, but he says he'll do his best. Yeah, he doesn't say any of that in the book. His initial threat stops Black in his tracks and causes the trio to exchange unsure glances. Hermione takes a tentative step forward and says that it wouldn't hurt to hear what they have to say. Snape responds by telling her she's facing suspension and says the three of them are out of bounds, telling her, for once in her life, to hold her tongue. That sentiment was captured pretty well during the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom scene where Snape was subbing for Lupin. Yeah, but having the movie leave this out marks the start of the films leaving out just how unstable Snape actually is. Because Hermione starts to argue, saying, but if there was a mistake, and he cuts her off to yell, keep quiet, you stupid girl, don't talk about what you don't understand. And sparks fly out of his wand as he screams. Well, very obviously, there can only be one crazy person, and that got taken up by crazy Gary Oldman. It's true. We can't, you can't have can't have crazy, crazy Alan Rickman. Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> That's just too much crazy for one movie. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh man, I kind of want a crazy Alan Rickman, crazy Gary Oldman face off though. Yeah, that would be pretty epic. So Unstable Snape finally manages to shut Hermione up, and he turns his attention back to Black, telling him that vengeance is so sweet, and he hoped he'd be the one to catch him. 
Which is what he said where we ended last week's movie section. Because, like we mentioned before, some of the same stuff does happen from the books during these movie sections, just in a different order. Which has not made organizing the movie sections to the chapters as easy as they were in the first two books and films. Mm-hmm. But you do it so well. I try. <laughs> But though the movie did have Snape make pretty much the same comment to Sirius, it did not have Sirius respond the same way he did in the book, where he said, The joke's on you again, Severus. As long as this boy brings his rat up to the castle, I'll come quietly. Snape tells him that he won't be taking him up to the castle. He'll just be calling the Dementors once they're out of the willow. This is, again, similar to the comment Snape was making in the film about not wanting to deny the Dementors. Also, the movie can't have Sirius reference the rat at this point, since it still hasn't been mentioned that Scabbers is Peter Pettigrew. Right. Black begins pleading, talking about the rat, but Snape is just completely beyond reason. He tells the trio to follow him and says that he will drag the werewolf, adding that maybe the Dementors will have a kiss for him too. Without thinking, Caps Lock Harry crosses the room and blocks the door. To be fair, normal Harry crosses the room, Caps Lock Harry makes an appearance after he realized how pointless it was to try to reason with Unstable Snape. There is that. He initially tries to point out that he was alone with Lupin loads of times all year, and if he had been helping Black, why didn't he finish him off then? Unstable Snape tells him not to ask him to fathom the way a werewolf's mind works and to get out of the way. Cue Caps Lock Harry. You're pathetic! Just because they made a fool out of you at school, you won't even listen! (laughs) This, of course, did nothing to help soothe Unstable Snape, who just screams back at him that he won't be spoken to like that. He also tells him, again, that he's just like his father and should be thanking him on bended knee for saving his neck, and again screams for him to get out of the way. Instead of moving, Harry pulls his wand out of his pocket and yells Expelliarmus at the exact same time that both Ron and Hermione do as well. Which makes way more sense than how the movie did it. They just had Harry reach around Hermione's back to grab her wand from out of her pocket. He also casts Expelliarmus, but okay, so the first 75 times Expelliarmus is used in the movie, all it does is flick the wand out of the other person's hand. So why in the holy fuck does it shoot Snape across the room? Like, he goes fucking flying! Are you kidding? Harry didn't say it with any extra emphasis or anything, so why the drastic effect now? I get that they needed Snape unconscious for the rest of the scene, but why change the effect of a spell we literally just saw cast three times in the last five minutes? Right? Honestly. In the book, it's because all three of them hit him with the same spell at the same time that it knocks him back into a wall, and that's what knocks him out. I get that having them all armed to be able to do that for the movie scene would have been some logistical gymnastics the way they had it set up, but maybe they shouldn't have done it wrong in the first place. No more logistical gymnastics than having the Whomping Willow fucking lasso them around. How about that? Those were literal logistical gymnastics. (laughs) They really were. (laughs) Did we just find the title? (laughs) You're right. There you go. At the very least, have him use a spell that actually throws someone backwards. I mean, it's not like those don't exist. Right, they could have used Flip Endo, like they made up for the video game. Right. It's literally the knockback jinx. Mm Mm-hmm. But then people definitely would have been like, that's not how it happened in the book. Yeah. Maybe we'd sell more t-shirts. Ooh. Maybe. In the movie, Snape flies across the room and crashes through the four-poster. Hermione is shocked and says, You attacked a teacher! You know, this from the girl who literally set fire to the man when she was 11, mind you. She did. She totally did. Hypocrite Hermione, (laughs) you attacked a teacher. And Harry's over there like, fucking A right I attacked a teacher. Like, let's be honest, I've been wanting to do that shit for three years. (laughs) He did. He totally did. (laughs) In the book, Black tells them that they shouldn't have done that. And Hermione repeatedly whimpers, we attacked a teacher. Worried they are going to be in so much trouble. (laughs) Harry tells Black that he's still not saying he believes him, and Black says that it's time they offered him proof. In the movie, Harry just turns his wand onto Sirius and says to tell him about Peter Pettigrew. Lupin explains that he was at school with them, and they thought he was their friend. Harry responds by saying, no, Pettigrew is dead, and that Black killed him. I always feel like this scene had to have been trimmed down and more of it actually exists somewhere because Harry's no and insistence that Black killed Pettigrew is such a non sequitur here. 
Right? <laughs> we thought he was our friend. No, he's dead. So we didn't think he was our friend? <laughs> Obviously not. Dead people can't be friends. Ever. There should have been more. There should have been the, we thought he was our friend, but then he betrayed Lily. I, I mean, I guess it was implied, but yeah. I don't know. It always struck me as weird. It, it is a very weird segue. It does not flow very well. I have to agree with you there, for sure. In the book, Sirius asks Ron for Peter, and Ron still tries to argue that it's ridiculous, that he's saying he broke out of Azkaban to get his hands on Scabbers. Even if Peter can turn into a rat, there are millions of them. How would he know which rat was Peter after being locked up in Azkaban? Which is a very good point that is completely left out of the movie. However, it was also a trivia question. Yep. In the book, Lupin tells Sirius that's a fair question. And Sirius pulls out a newspaper clipping of the photograph of Ron's family in Egypt, with Scabbers right on Ron's shoulder. When Lupin asks where he got it, Sirius explains that it was from Fudge when he came to inspect Azkaban. Lupin looks closely at the picture and sees that Scabbers is missing a toe, realizing that he must have cut it off himself, and tells Ron that the biggest part of Pettigrew they found was his finger. This does get referenced in the movie, just, you know, not yet, or in the same way. After Harry says that Sirius killed Pettigrew, Lupin says that he thought so too until Harry mentioned seeing him on the map. Harry says that the map was lying, and Black interrupts to say that the map never lies. And how are they gonna just gloss over the fact that Sirius obviously knows how the map works too? Right. By this point of the book, we already know that Sirius was one of the makers of the map, so of course he would know how it works. But the way they set this up in the movie scene... It just really left us with all these extra questions. Mm -hmm. Well, not us, mm. since we read the books, but the people who only saw the movies or saw the movies first. Yeah. But finally, we get to the part where Sirius shares that Peter is a rat. None of the why, but finally, the big reveal. Black points a finger across the room towards Ron, saying, He's right there. And Ron looks super confused and says, Me? He's mental. And I just love how Sirius is so done with Ron being a dumbass. And he's like, not you, you're a rat. Amazingly enough, this part of the movie is kind of similar to the corresponding chapter section. What? In both, Ron talks about how long Scabbers has been in his family. In the book, Lupin says it's been 12 years. In the movie, it was Black who pointed out that it was 12 years and says that it's a curiously long time for a common garden rat. Yeah, Lupin asks Ron if he ever wondered why he was living so long, and dumbass Ron makes an appearance in the book, too, when he tries to claim that they've been taking good care of him. Oh yeah, just, you know, leaving him everywhere and not knowing where the fuck he is at any given point in time, and oh, don't forget that your mom had to run him to you as the train was fucking taking off. Jesus Christ. Take care of your plot points, Ron. Damn. Exactly. <laughs> Lupin points out that he's not looking so good now, and Ron tries to blame that mad cat Crookshanks, but Harry remembers that Scabbers had been looking ill since Ron's return from Egypt, around the same time Black escaped. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> None of that was in the movie. <laughs> Shocker, I know. It just goes straight into Black pointing out that he has a missing toe, prompting Harry to remember that all they found of Pettigrew was his finger. Black explains that Peter cut it off so that everyone would think he was dead. So, and again, same information in the book, slightly different package. And obviously the movie couldn't include this part since they completely cut Crookshanks out of this section. But this is where we learn about the relationship between Crookshanks and Sirius Black. Because Black explains that the cat isn't mad, he's the most intelligent of his kind he's ever met. He immediately recognized Peter and him for what they really are. It took him a while to gain his trust, but once he did, Crookshanks helped him by trying to bring him Peter and by stealing the passwords off a boy's bedside table. Aw, poor Ickle Neville. He didn't leave those passwords laying around at all. Nope, got punished for nothing. Hmm... Harry is still pretty confused by the whole absurd story, and when Sirius mentions Peter trying to fake his death a second time, his anger takes over and he asks why Peter would have faked his own death, answering his own question by saying that he knew Black wanted to murder him like he murdered Harry's parents. He accuses Black of being there to finish him off. Black admits that he is, 
But Lupin quickly interjects to point out that all this time they thought Sirius betrayed Harry's parents and Peter tracked him down, but it was the other way around. Peter betrayed Harry's parents and Sirius tracked Peter down. This brings about another visit from Caps Lock Harry. That's not true. He said so before you turned up. He said he killed them. That's not how it happened in the movie. Though we do sort of get this information after they officially confront Pettigrew. Before then, Ron is just holding scabbers like he's wringing out a goddamn bar rag, and Sirius pulls him from his grasp. The rap begins struggling and squeaking as Lupin and Black both point their wands at him. Black does not have to snatch the rat from Ron in the book. Of course, he's not crazy Gary Oldman either, so at this point, he's actually somewhat calm, though emotional, as he confesses that he as good as killed them, because he persuaded them to switch to Peter as their secret keeper at the last minute. The night it had happened, he went to check on Peter and found him gone with no sign of struggle. He headed straight to the Potter's house and found it destroyed and James and Lily dead. Yeah, the movie doesn't actually go into those extra details about the night of the betrayal or, honestly, much of the actual betrayal itself. I wish they would have kept in Sirius explaining how he feels like he killed them by switching the Secret Keeper. Because I just love that. Because... It shows how much guilt he actually held and why he never really like fought back about being sent to Azkaban was because he felt like, yeah, I fucked up. I killed them. I killed my friends. You know, I wish they would have kept it in. Yeah. But what we do get also happens after the confrontation with Pettigrew. Which we are getting at. Mm -hmm. In the book, Lupin says it's time to prove what they are saying and asks Ron for the rat. He says they are going to force him to show himself, and if he really is just a rat, it won't hurt him. So Ron hands over Scabbers. Sirius and Lupin decide to transform him together, and on the count of three, a flash of blue-white light erupts from their wands, and Scabbers twists and transforms into a short man with unkempt, balding hair and the shrunken appearance of someone who lost a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. And something very rat-like also lingered in his pointed nose and small, watery eyes. So the book transformation was nowhere near dramatic, or, let's be honest, slapsticky enough for the film. As Black and Lupin both have their wands pointed at the rat, for some reason, Black decides to set him down. Why would they just set down the wriggling rat to change it back? Why not just stun or petrify the little bastard first? It just seems unnecessary, if you ask me. I mean, if they hadn't set him down, the transformation would have been too close to what happened in the book, and apparently they can't have that. Plus, this movie can't resist the slapstick, like, at all. (laughs) Right? Oh no, I put the rat down and now it's scurrying away! Who could have predicted this silly outcome? And it is silly, since the rat runs across a piano and plays a few notes as Larry and Moe attempt to hit him with a spell. (laughs) The only thing that would have made it sillier is if Scabbers had played chopsticks while jumping across the (laughs) piano keys. Also, why is there a piano? I have no idea. It just seems so random. It is very random. But, I mean, how else are you going to get a rat to play a few notes? It's true. I mean, come on. Is there maybe a comedic rule that says, like, piano equals slapstick? Yeah, but it's usually dropping on someone's head. That is very true. It would have been great if, like, one of them would have gone over the piano and been like, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Like, just The entertainer. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Exactly. Yeah-da-da-da-da-da-da. That's the one. Slapstick. Although, I gotta say, despite all of that, the shot through the hole in the door of Scabbers finally transforming is really quite amazing. Like, I mean, this is some truly great acting. I don't know how you would do the research to be able to accurately depict a man living as a rat for 12 years finally being changed back into a man, but this boy definitely did it. And we will definitely be talking more about this after we finish this section when we talk about the new actors. Mm -hmm. Well, actor. (laughs) But I agree. It was a great depiction of the book's mention of the lingering rat appearance. Mm -hmm. But these parallel scenes continue on differently as well. In the book... Peter legit just tries to continue the lie that Sirius killed James and Lily and was coming after him. Yeah, in the movie, he takes one look at his old friends and tries to run again, because that's what innocent people do. Totally innocent. (laughs) They catch him and shove him back into the middle of the room. 
Pettigrew looks around and sees Harry and tells him just how much he looks like James. This happens in the book, too, but it's after a lot more conversation than the movie includes. Mm -hmm. In addition to Peter lying about Sirius being the traitor, he also claimed that he knew he would come back for him. Which makes Lupin question how Peter could have known that when no one has ever broken out of Azkaban before. Peter says that Sirius has dark powers the rest of them can only dream of. He must have learned a few tricks from the Dark Lord. This just makes Sirius laugh and say, Voldemort, teach me tricks. As much as I love crazy Gary Oldman, I do love the attitude that he portrays in the book. Like, it doesn't get fully appreciated in the movie. It just doesn't. Yeah, it definitely does a little, mm -hmm. but not as much. No. Because he then full-on taunts Peter for cringing at the name Voldemort. What, scared to hear your old master's name? I don't blame you, Peter. His lot aren't very happy with you, are they? Peter keeps on denying, and Black tells him that he hasn't been hiding from him. He's been hiding from Voldy's followers, who managed to stay out of Azkaban, because they think the double-crosser double-crossed them. I know that they were likely trying to keep the tension going in this movie scene, but I still wish we had gotten all this extra detail. Yeah. Peter keeps trying to deny, and Lupin speaks up, saying he has difficulty understanding why an innocent man would spend 12 years as a rat. Peter insists that if Voldemort's supporters are angry with him, it's because he put their best man in Azkaban, the spy Sirius Black. Sirius challenges him, asking when did he ever sneak around people who were stronger and more powerful than himself. He says he'll never understand how he didn't see it before. Peter always liked big friends to look after him. Yeah, it used to be Sirius, Remus, and James. Honestly, I'm not sure how they didn't see it before either. Like, dude turns into a fucking rat. His animal is literally known for being dirty and rot with disease. Like, the term literally means double-crosser or snitch. I mean, it doesn't get more clear-cut than that, no? I don't think so. It should have been obvious. You would think. Peter, of course, keeps trying to deny things. And Sirius says Lily and James only made him secret keeper because he suggested it. He thought it was the perfect bluff that Voldemort would be sure to come after him, never dreaming they'd use a weak, talentless thing like him. Harry notices that Pettigrew's face is starting to turn pale, and Hermione speaks up to ask why Scabbers, this man, never tried to hurt Harry before now. Which is a very good question, and one which the movie obviously doesn't address. Peter also thinks this is a very good question, but Black has a very good answer and says it's because he never did anything for anyone unless he could see what was in it for him. He said Peter wasn't about to commit murder right under Albus Dumbledore's nose for a wreck of a wizard who lost all his power. I mean, that seems like a legit and sound argument. Certainly not one that crazy Gary Oldman would make. And that's probably partially why the movie left it out. Probably. Like I said before, I get that they were just trying to keep the scene moving, but I really missed all of this backstory. Mm -hmm. I imagine they just thought it was too much dialogue. Because then Hermione also addresses Black as Mr. Black, er, Sirius, which totally <laughs> startles him and that would have been fun to see. <laughs> well, he went to Azkaban really young, so I doubt he would ever have been Mr. Black before then. Yeah, it's understandable. It's just a nice touch. Yeah. Like, but Mr. Black who? Wait. <laughs> Mr. Black is my father. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Hermione asks him how he did get out of Azkaban if he didn't use dark magic. And he ponders about it and explains that he thinks he didn't lose his mind because he knew he was innocent. And that wasn't a happy thought, so the Dementors couldn't take it from him. And that kept him sane. Hmm. He could also transform into a dog whenever it got to be too much. Since Dementors are blind, they just sense emotions. And all they could sense when he was a dog was that his feelings were less complex. Which I think is really interesting, actually. The movie really just left how he escaped a mystery. So... It's nice to have this information. He also tells them that when he saw the picture with Peter, he realized he was perfectly positioned to strike the moment he heard the dark side was gathering power again. If he delivered them Harry Potter, no one would dare call him a traitor. Mm -hmm. That thought became an obsession, and it gave him strength enough to slip past the Dementors as they brought him food and to swim back as a dog to the mainland. In our Potterheads A History episode last month, we talked about wanting a Marauders series. And I think I'd also really want to know more about Azkaban as part of it. Because, like, who prepares the food that they serve the prisoners? 
do other wizards work there and then have to deal with the Dementors as co-workers? Is there an Azkaban kitchen? Like, do they prepare it off-site and ship it in each day? And I think the most important question, is it any good? Those are all very good questions. Right? The Marauder's story could follow them from kids at Hogwarts up to each of their ends, which would include an inside look at Azkaban for Sirius. I just got a mental image of, like, the Azkaban break room and, like... <laughs> <laughs> Like regular wizards, like walking past Dementors. Hey, Bernie, how you doing today? <laughs> like, the Dementor just goes, <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> Whoops, sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> I'm sorry, this day just really sucks. <laughs> now I just want that. I legitimately just want the Azkaban kitchen break room scene. <laughs> <laughs> it would be so awesome. Right? But back to the chapter at hand. Sirius explains that he traveled north to Hogwarts and lived in the forest as a dog. He said that he came to watch the Quidditch match and that Harry flew as well as his father did. Then his voice croaks as he says, Believe me, I never betrayed James and Lily. I would have died before I betrayed them. And I'm not crying, you're crying. He does say something extremely similar in the movie, but it doesn't have the same level of emotion to it because he's yelling it at Peter instead of directing it towards Harry. Which I will let you talk about as soon as I finish this last bit of the book chapter to line it back up with the movie scene. Ah, oh, fine. Harry now believes Sirius and Peter starts to panic and plead for his life. First begging Lupin, trying to sow some doubt by asking why Sirius didn't tell him of the plan. Lupin, of course, realizes that it was because they thought he was the spy, and Black asks him to forgive him. I would have loved to have seen this part, too, just because it's so sweet when Lupin says, Not at all, Padfoot, old friend. And will you, in turn, forgive me for believing you were the spy? Right? I love them. Aww. They agree to kill him together, and Pettigrew starts begging Ron to save him, because he was a good pet. Ron just looks disgusted and says, I let you sleep in my bed. <laughs> and Black points out that being a better rat than human is nothing to boast about. Peter turns his attention to Hermione, pleading with her to save him. She backs away horrified, and he turns towards Harry, saying he looks just like his father. And now they kind of line up again. Since the last thing that we talked about from the movie was Peter saying this to Harry. In both, Sirius yells at him for speaking to Harry about James. In the movie, Remus and Sirius corner him and confront him about selling James and Lily to Voldemort. This basically happens in the book, too. Just before they corner him, Pettigrew manages to tell Harry that James would have shown him mercy, and then Black says, You sold Lily and James to Voldemort. Do you deny it? In both, Peter snivels and makes excuses, like a rat does, blaming his cowardice on the weapons the Dark Lord had. In the movie, he asks Sirius what he would have done, and this is when Sirius screams that he would have died rather than betray his friends. It was much more forceful and dramatic than the book. Yeah, it definitely made quite an impact. Not the same way. Like, I read that in the book, and I kind of tear up. Mm -hmm. I watch it in the movie, and I'm just like, oh, bam! <laughs> you tell him, Sirius, you tell him! Well, it is delivered by crazy Gary Oldman, so yeah. I mean, there's that. At this point in the book, instead of asking Sirius what he would have done, Peter just flat out says that he was scared and never meant it to happen. Caps Lock Sirius yells, Don't lie! You've been passing information to him for a year before Lily and James died. You were his spy! Peter says that he was taking over everywhere. What was there to be gained by fighting him? And Black responds saying, Only innocent lives, Peter. Bam! Mic drop! In the movie, he crawls under the piano, because... That's what rats do, and tries to run for the door again. But Harry steps in front of him. Peter grabs him by the shoulders and gives him a similar line to the books about how Harry's dad would have spared him. Lupin and Black pulled him off Harry, and once again, they point their wands at him. In the book, Peter makes one more excuse, saying that he would have killed him. And Black responds by telling him that he should have died. Died rather than betrayed his friends as they would have done for him. Peter so did not deserve those friends. Nope, the dirty rat. Mm-hmm. Side note, imagine how disgusting Pettigrew's breath was after living on rat food and no toothbrushes for 12 years. Like, no wonder Harry looked like he was going to be legit sick. Not just his breath, all of him. It's not like he was showering or anything. Yeah, ew! Ugh. 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 Blah. In 
both, Sirius and Remus are about to kill Peter, and Harry stops them. In the movie, Lupin reminds him that Pettigrew is the reason Harry doesn't have parents, and Harry is all like, yeah, thanks, man, I got that. You want to talk about how the Dursleys abused me, too? Because that's the thing that happened. <laughs> yes, let's poke at the rotten apples in Harry's happy memory orchard, and then try to conjure Patronuses. Patroni? Patronia? Pat- Patronum? Patron. Ha ha, we gonna get lit tonight. Lit one. <laughs> Lumos, bitches. But anyways, in the book, it's Black who reminds Harry about Peter's crimes. In both, Peter begins to grovel, and Harry tells him to get off of him. In the book, he tells him that it's just because he doesn't reckon his dad would want Sirius and Remus to become killers just for Pettigrew. In the movie, he just says that they will take him to the castle, and the Dementors can have him after that. The book has Black say that Harry is the only person that has the right to decide, and Harry says that he can go to Azkaban. Lupin agrees and asks Harry to stand aside so he can tie him up. He tells Peter that if he transforms, he will kill him, and Harry nods. In the movie, Peter just snivels and acts pretty rat-like some more. And that is where we end the scene. The book has a few more paragraphs, where Lupin tells Ron he can't mend legs as well as Madame Pomfrey, so he just splints it with the spell ferula, which is the Latin word for rod. So it's pretty literal. (laughs) You said rod. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Rod. Hermione asks about Snape, who is out cold, because the trio were a little overenthusiastic, and they decide not to revive him until they are back at the castle. He says mobile corpus, and Snape floats upright with its head lawing sideways. Just think if they hadn't waited to revive him. Like, he would have seen Pettigrew, and maybe things would have gone differently. Or maybe not, knowing Snape. Yeah, yeah, all right, fair. Black says that two of them should be chained to Pettigrew, and Lupin and Ron volunteer. He conjures manacles and chains each of Pettigrew's hands to one of Ron's and Lupin's. Crookshank jumps off the bed and leads the way out of the room, and this is where the book chapter ends. Which will bring us to our new actor section, where we get to talk about Timothy Spall as Peter Pettigrew. I love this man. I mean, you already mentioned just how well he nailed that I was a man that lived as a rat for 12 years, and now I'm a man again. He's a man! He's a man! (laughs) I don't entirely know what I expected when his casting was announced, but he's an amazing actor, and I think he brought that to this part because he did so well. I've seen him in quite a few other things. He's another one of those big British names. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's also kind of a chameleon. You know, that's what I was thinking, too. He's done a lot of different parts. He's played Mm -hmm. villains. He's played the good guy. He's... Yes, he is not typecast. Yeah. And I love it. I mean, yes, he definitely did awesome. But let's be honest, those teeth did half of the job for him. Oh, God. Just like Sirius's, man. Whoever did the dental work on the set was amazing. I think we should give a special shout out to the makeup and costume crew of Prisoner of Azkaban because they did a really great job. I wasn't as excited about the normal clothes that they put the wizards in, but... Yeah. But when it came to making a man look like he just became a man again after having been a rat for 12 years, they fucking nailed it. Right? They really did. And his mannerisms fucking nailed it. And his, like, sniveling. Yeah, his sniveling and his, his voice... He had a very rat-like voice. Like yeah. if a rat could talk, that's what he'd sound like. Timothy Spall is aces in my book. This will bring us to our Potter pondering. We are again just going to ask about your thoughts on the large amounts of backstory left out of this section. But bonus points if you also make up some answers to my questions about Azkaban. Who prepares the food they serve the prisoners? Do other wizards work there and have to deal with the Dementors as co-workers? Is there an Azkaban kitchen? Do they prepare it off-site and ship it in each day? And most importantly, let's be honest, is the food any good? I'm thinking no, but I'd like to know what our keepers think. So find the post on our Facebook page and let us know what you think. We really look forward to reading them. And this will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Scott Henderson. He writes, I am a Gryffindor, my wand is Elmwood with a dragon heartstring core, and my Patronus is a wolf. I got into Harry Potter just as the first movie came out. I decided to read the books first, read everything that was out, and couldn't wait for the next. I still prefer the books to the movies, but will gladly watch them whenever. Thanks for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Scott. Yeah, thank you. 
And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story in a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. You can also just message us on social media. This will bring us to this week's trivia question, which is, what is Harry's happy thought as he attempts to conjure a Patronus to drive off the hundreds of Dementors attacking them just after Pettigrew escaped? The prize for the first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word, hashtag, think happy thoughts, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. In addition to getting you some extra perks like Just Keep Rolling swag, patron-only Facebook groups, virtual meetups, bonus content, and more, your patronage also helps us to continue producing this podcast, our cooking show, and bringing more content your way. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, monthly blooper reels, vlogs, and other random videos. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 20, The Dementor's Kiss, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.